Gold declined for the third week in a row following hawkish statements from Jerome Powell at the last Jackson Hole Symposium last week. What is the future of gold on a both long-term and short-term basis? Well, that is a theme of our discussion with our next guest, John Butler, author of the book, The Golden Revolution, How to Prepare for the Coming Global Gold Standard. John is also an editor at South Bank Investment Research, and prior to this, he's had over 25 years of experience in senior positions at top investment banks, including Lehman Brothers. Welcome to the show, John. It's your first time. Pleasure to have you. My pleasure, David. Thanks for having me. John, I want to talk about your book and the coming global gold standard and what this means for our global monetary system. But first, let's talk about gold as it relates to the Fed. So as I mentioned, hawkish tone from the Fed. How do you see this playing out in the medium term for gold? Well, I believe that gold is under pressure for entirely understandable, normal macroeconomic reasons relating to expectations for where we are in the rate hiking cycle. And you've cited recent rhetoric out of the Fed. That's absolutely a key component of that. But let's face it, right? We did see this huge spike in inflation, which is not simply the effect of the unfortunate war in Ukraine, but was building throughout lockdowns, which gummed up all manner of supply chains. That's a negative supply shock. And yet, on the other hand, you had governments throwing all sorts of money uh, around to try and buffer the negative impact that that would all have on households and businesses. And so you ended up with a classic, classic mix of a lot more money chasing fewer goods. And the only way markets clear under those conditions, as Milton Friedman, among others, taught us, is prices have to rise. And so I was uh, expecting a sub very substantial rise in inflation, even back when the initial wave of COVID was coming through and lockdowns were being imposed. And the pressure's only built. And sure, now we see it, right? Now we see all this pressure coming to bear. And of course, it is exacerbated by the unfortunate war in Ukraine. So I predicted already at the very start of the year that we were going to pass through what I called at the time a hawkish moment. And I use the word moment for a reason because I wanted to stress that it's going to be hawkish for sure, but it's going to be very short term. And the reason I felt it was going to be short term was because I believe the underlying structural weaknesses of the US and global economy, and this includes China, the world's second largest economy, are much greater than generally uh, assumed. And that even small baby step increases in interest rates, God forbid much larger ones, would have a disproportionately negative impact relative to market expectations. And indeed, central banks would be surprised just how much negative impact they would have on the outlook for economic activity. They were therefore paused sooner rather than later, shift from very hawkish to more neutral rhetoric pretty quickly. Hence, it would just be a hawkish moment. I think we're approaching that moment now. Okay, but this hawkish moment hasn't really been conducive to high gold prices so far. No. There's going to be no. a pivot, you think? and it won't be. It, it has to be. pass. The, mo the moment has to come and go. We're in it right now. It's taking place right now. Um, but I believe it is going to go, and when it goes, uh, and markets reassess, uh, I believe, in a very substantial way, that central banks are far more powerless to act uh, on this inflation than they thought. I think gold is going to recover all of its losses this year and indeed reach new highs. Now, that will take time like anything else. Yes. But I think when it does happen, it's going to happen asymmetrically. That is, the recovery will be asymmetric relative to the decline, in my opinion. Now, uh, let's talk about inflation very briefly. Uh, several gold analysts I've had on the show have made various theories or speculations as to why the gold price did not respond positively to higher inflation this year. What's yours? I believe, first of all, to some extent, higher inflation was priced in, but to some extent, the spike that we saw absolutely was not. I believe central banks realized that this could be problematic fairly early on, did begin to adjust rhetoric a bit. And I think central I think central banks have been trying to build this confidence and credibility that they've still got it and they can deal with this. They know how to deal with this. And so gold, I believe, for those sort of natural reasons, uh, has struggled a bit. But keep in mind, this is as much or more a U.S. dollar story as it is a gold story. If you look at gold in sterling terms, pretty unchanged for the year. If you look at gold in euro terms, pretty unchanged for the year. In yen terms, 
gold's pretty unchanged for the year. So it's really a dollar story as much as anything else. It's, it's as if do- the dollar's the outlier and not gold. Now, of course, that begs the question, why is the dollar so strong? And I believe that has to do with perceptions that the U.S. is still a safe haven, that the U.S. is the so-called cleanest dirty shirt, and that the U.S. economy is therefore better able to absorb higher interest rates without causing serious economic damage. I fundamentally disagree with that. And I know that's a controversial view, but I think the dollar is overvalued here and has a lot of exposure to the downside when we pass through this hawkish moment, uh, as we discussed a moment ago. Okay, well, let's talk about the dollar. So, yeah, you're right. Those are excellent points. Another another view that I've heard is that the dollar has been strong because of the uh, differentiation between interest rates here domestically and abroad. The U.S. central bank has been more hawkish thus far than other central banks. The U.S. interest rate has risen faster than other interest rates abroad. And so the differentiation is higher and therefore more capital flows into the U.S. dollar. Do you think this differentiation between interest rates is going to last? In other words, will the Fed remain the most hawkish central bank for long? No, I don't think it will. And as I as I did suggest, I think these these perceptions about the relative superiority and flexibility of the U.S. economy, first of all, I believe they're already basically priced in. And I also think they're simply overblown. That is, let's keep in mind, the U.S. has gone through tremendous structural changes over the past uh, couple of decades. Uh, it's got a far higher average tax rate than it used to have. It's got far higher household, corporate and public sector debt to GDP than it used to have. It's got a far more expensive and difficult regulatory burden to comply with uh, than it used to have. And this idea that the US is fundamentally a more flexible, dynamic economy than others around the world is simp- it's hard, it's increasingly hard to make that case today. And I believe that will begin to show up um, in the data that the US economy is unable Uh, to last uh, with strength if interest rates continue to rise and the Fed will blink sooner than most people believe. One more question about the Fed, and I'll move on to uh, long-term structural problems with the dollar. Uh, So the Federal Reserve uh, hinted that they would raise an unusually large amount by September, the next meeting, which is actually uh, in a few weeks. (laughs) So that's coming up. Uh, First of all, do you think they'll follow through with that? And second, long-term... By long term, I mean the next couple of months. Do you think they could pivot, potentially stop raising interest rates, maybe even cut interest rates? I've heard that position before from some people. I think the Fed is good for one more sizable rate increase. And I believe they're going to follow through with that because it is a credibility restoration exercise. Uh, I believe they want to build that credibility. And let's face it, even though you've had a very modest amount uh, of stock market weakness uh, so far this year, it's just it's the order of magnitude is, is very, very small. Where there's more concern is in credit markets. And the Fed is also very concerned about credit markets. So that is something I'm sure they're watching. But nevertheless, I think they are good for one more large increase. After that, I think it's very likely they tone down the rhetoric almost immediately and see what happens, Mm -hmm. step back a bit. And then I think what you'll find is that the general global economic downturn, which of course includes the U.S., which is technically already in recession, uh, I believe that the numbers will start to force the Fed's hand towards a more explicit acknowledgement that the hiking cycle is probably over and that inflation is going to trend downwards of its own accord back to something in the low single digits, say on a one to two year time horizon. That's where I that's where I think they're going to end up. That will weaken the dollar, that will strengthen the gold price and start kicking off, you know, the general sort of picture that I have. Uh, going forward. Okay, we will come back to your gold price outlook towards the end of the interview. So uh, if you're watching, stay tuned for that. Uh, Let's talk about the future of the dollar in offline. You're telling me about the bifurcation of the global monetary system and uh, the end of the golden age of uh, a unipolar world in terms of the dollar hegemony and uh, the the beginning of what's possibly a multipolar monetary system. So I'm just going to read a paragraph from an article 
written by my colleague at Kitco News, Anna Golubova. The headline is Putin's BRICS new currency could benefit gold and Bitcoin, says analysts. Earlier this summer, President, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin said that Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa are developing a new basket-based reserve currency. He says the issue of creating an international reserve currency based on a basket of currencies of our countries is being worked out, Putin said at a BRICS business forum at the end of June. We are ready to openly work with all fair partners. From a broader picture, uh, John, what is going on right now? Well, the BRICS have not been silent about their willingness to work towards some sort of restructuring of the international monetary system, which is, in their view, a bit better balanced and a bit fairer for all parties. And indeed, you have had formal statements made in BRIC summits going back over a decade to the effect of saying explicitly that they thought the way the current system worked with the dollar at the center, of course, did not really serve their best interests nor the best interests of the world more generally. So this has been a rhetorical talking point for an awfully long time. But if you look where we now are with the, let's face it, quite heightened degree of geopolitical tensions around the world, not only in Ukraine, right, there are multiple hotspots here, I can see why the BRICS are moving perhaps from rhetoric to more practical action to try to catalyze uh, some sort of restructuring of the system. And indeed, the BRICS as a whole comprise a substantially larger portion of the global economy than the United States. It's roughly double. And if they decide to somehow come up with a way to trade bilaterally and to use each other's currencies as reserves or to create a basket of their own currencies and use that as reserves and then to create their own sort of IMF to manage it, as it were, um, look, I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, and I'm not even saying if they try it, they're, they're going to be able to pull it off. It, and it could be hugely disruptive, and it might simply not work. But it's looking like they might well be ready to try. And if so, that would be a world historical event in, in terms of its impact on the international monetary system. People have been talking about the decline of the dollar on a long-term secular basis, perhaps even the end of U.S. dollar hegemony around the world, and perhaps even more catastrophically, an explosion or an implosion of the dollar domestically. Uh, and that could be very bad. But people have to remember that currently the majority of global trade or a large percentage of global trade is still done in U.S. dollars. I'm just going to quote, quote a figure uh, uh, from the uh, European Central Bank's paper that they published in July 2021. Uh, they wrote uh, in this paper that the dominant role of the U.S. dollar as an invoicing currency in global trade is well established. Roughly 40% of international trade transactions and goods are invoiced in dollars. Now, this is very high. I, I read other reports that it, it could be high as 65. So depending on which source, it, it, the, the, unequivocally, uh, the U.S. dollar is a very important currency in global trade. So I don't think it's going away anytime soon, though. Let's talk about uh, how this may change over the long term. Look, I don't think the dollar is going away either. I, I just believe that the relatively unbalanced monetary system or unipolar monetary system, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. which has prevailed post Bretton Woods, notwithstanding the formal ending of gold backing for US dollar reserves. I'm just saying that that, that has a sell-by date, and I don't believe it's compatible with a general shift of economic and, to that, for that matter, other forms of, of power around the world towards a more multipolar structure. And indeed, if you look at history in my book, <laughs> my book looks at a lot of history. Yes. If you look at history, the, the uh, for, uh, unipolar monetary systems may be normal. Reserve currency based systems around a single currency may be normal. But historically, with the one exception of the unbacked US dollar, they have all been backed by a very, very specific weight measured amount of gold and or silver that is fundamentally different from a currency issued by a central bank without any restraint or constraint uh, imposed on it by the structure of the international monetary system. Nature restricts the gold a gold standard type system, even if there's a single issuer of the dominant coinage. 
Mother Nature does that because she determines how much gold there is around. Okay. Whereas today, there is no natural constraint on money creation. In my opinion, when you're in a unipolar world, yes, the monetary hegemon can impose its monetary preferences on the world at large. We've been experiencing that for decades, ever since the 1970s. But that is a historical anomaly, and I believe it is fundamentally incompatible with a multipolar world where countries will demand a more equitable distribution mm -hmm. of the power of money creation. And indeed, and this is the real crux of the argument in my book, this is where it comes together. The classical gold standard itself arose out of a lot of monetary mayhem. There, was a, there were a lot of disputes about exactly how the international monetary system should work. And indeed, a gold standard can be best understood as a system or a structure that arises out of a failure to agree precisely how money should be created. And so if we're going back to that sort of level of dispute, competition, disagreement yes. at the international monetary level, gold solves for the game theoretic monetary equilibrium for a multipolar world that is nevertheless hugely dependent on international trade. This multipolar world, is this going to come because of changes in the global monetary system alone? Or is this going to come because the U.S. will lose its hegemony as also a global military and political power? Usually in the past, a global reserve currency uh, was backed by a country that was also the world's superpower at the time. So the dollar has, the dollar has enjoyed superpower status for the last 70 years. Is this going to change? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, look, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. This is far more complex than I've been able to get into here. Although in my book, I do touch on political yes. and military aspects of this. Now, I would argue that ultimately all power derives from economic power. Okay. It may derive over long periods of time. Um, and, and, and certainly in the short term, military power can be hugely important in international affairs, as anyone who has studied major wars would know. Um, but ultimately, it's economic. And in my opinion, it's just not realistic for the United States to rely on purely monetary dominance to somehow reverse what has been actually at this point, nearly a 70-year trend of a gradual erosion of relative economic power on the part of the United States. Mm -hmm. At the end of the Second World War, the U.S. economy was roughly half the entire global economy by activity. Today, it's only 20%. That's a huge relative decline in U.S. economic power. And I just believe that, the, that don't, don't get me wrong, I mean, I'm not, I'm not dismissing military power for one second, but sure. if you just extrapolate this trend, ultimately, it's going to tip the balance, regardless of whether the U.S. retains military superiority or not. Well, in this multipolar world, John, which currency do you think will most likely challenge the U.S. dollar? Well, or this currencies? is the thing. In a, it, this, this is the thing. In a way, none of them do. Uh, let me explain. If okay. you've seen the film A Beautiful Mind, uh, that film uh, uh, goes through an example of uh, explaining John Nash equilibrium game theory, the concept of a Nash equilibrium. And there's this wonderful scene that takes place in a bar where a young John Nash, PhD, PhD student, is uh, sitting around chatting with his mates over a few beers. And in walk uh, a group of you know, quite attractive young ladies. And uh, you know, naturally, they're inclined to go over and chat them up. But one of the young ladies is... Yeah, just don't take this the wrong way, but one of those particularly tall, particularly blonde, particularly stunning and attractive. And all of them are sort of thinking, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to approach her. But John Nash realizes the problem. If they all approach her at once, they're going to not only put her off a bit, but they're going to put off her friends who get ignored. And as a group, the girls won't feel comfortable. They won't want to talk to them at all. And they might even leave the bar. And so John Nash realizes, wait a minute. We must agree amongst ourselves. No one talks to the blonde. And that way we get to chat up the ladies. Genius. That's a Nash equilibrium. It's, a, it's, a, it's adopting the strategy that best satisfies all players' interests, including your own. That's the gold standard. That, the blonde, right, 
agreeing to avoid her is the gold standard. In monetary terms, the blonde represents the printing press, who doesn't just want to print their own money, who doesn't just want to devalue their currency for competitive advantage. Everyone does. But if everyone does it, no one benefits. Whereas if everyone just agrees, nope, we're going to agree on gold, which none of us can print, none of us can manipulate, none of us can control, then we have a level international monetary playing field that does not favor any one player over any other player. That's the Nash monetary equilibrium. That's the thesis I put forward in my book. I'm not uh, discounting the Nash uh, equilibrium, which ultimately won the Nobel Prize for economics, but uh, my friends and I discovered this theory a long time ago, even before we watched that movie. <laughs> so oh, so okay. <laughs> there is some truth in that in the real life Very good. Uh, that I've observed. Uh, yeah, don't uh, compete for resources, otherwise you're going to be left alone. Okay, let's talk, but just, re just to rephrase my question, uh, again, 60% of global trade is currently done in the U.S. dollar. If this ratio were to fall, uh, which other currencies could pick up the slack is what I'm getting at. Okay. Oh, look, I mean, in theory, all of them. What I'm saying is that I believe that whole process catalyzes itself into a new gold-backed global monetary system. All right. But in theory, but in, but in theory, what that means is it almost gets to the point where it doesn't matter which currency you're invoicing in because if they're all gold-backed, then in a way – they sh they're all going to be stable relative to each other. And you get much more certainty at the international level regarding uh, the stability of your assets, of your cash flows, of your trade, uh, regardless of whether it happens to specifically be yuan denominated, dollar denominated, yen denominated, euro denominated, so on and so forth. So in my opinion, kind of all of them, right? I believe all of them at that point competing on a level playing field will be used. And indeed, when it comes to bilateral trade, presumably the dominant currencies will be the ones that are issued by those two countries engaging in that bilateral trade. Mm -hmm. When you look at the scale of, of exports from countries like China and Germany uh, or the euro area more generally, you know, you can make a strong case that the dollar is not going to be any more dominant in invoicing if you move to that sort of system than either the euro or, or the Chinese yuan. You did write in your book, with no single BRICS economy in a position to dominate the others, it is far more logical for them to move toward the use of an objective reference currency that can be trusted and accepted by all. A gold-backed currency of some sort would be ideally suited for that. Uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about some of the assumptions behind that paragraph. So first, uh, why do you think gold is still currently, in today's environment, a trusted source of uh, by all parties. I mean, it was in the past. Is it still going to be trusted to the same degree now? I believe it is. And it goes back to what I mentioned very early on. The fact is, is that nobody can print gold. Nobody can create gold. You only can come up with more gold either by exporting more than you import, and then, of course, you accumulate gold, or, of course, you find a way to dig more out of the ground. But that's expensive, takes time and money, and you only do it when the price of gold is sufficiently high to make that economically worthwhile. And mm -hmm. so the supply of gold becomes kind of a self-regulating system vis-a-vis -vis the demand for gold. And that, to me, is a much, much better basis for international trade and growth uh, than the system we currently have. Uh, which is one where nobody can really agree or know. It's nice to know that Mother Nature determines how much gold is available, as opposed to you know the country across the way with which you do trade, but you don't necessarily completely trust to honor its commitments. Maybe indeed you'll fall prey to economic sanctions at some point. Do you really want to be holding assets denominated in that country's currency, whereas you know gold is no national asset in that sense? It belongs to the planet. And it, and it was created by Mother Earth. So to me, it kind of solves this problem of mistrust, distrust, competition, and yet also cooperation at the international level. It facilitates all the good things about international trade while mitigating the potential bad things about monetary manipulation. Let's assume, I'm not saying it will happen, but let's assume a gold standard is inevitable for uh, many countries around the world. Uh, if that were the case, John, why would I invest in gold today? Because keep in mind, during the Bretton Woods system, the gold price was fixed. It was very flat. And so 
you know, if you assume that the same system would reoccur, the gold price would be managed, it would be flat, I wouldn't gain capital appreciation as an investor. And uh, there's also a possibility that my gold might be confiscated by the government. Those are cases against investing in gold now, are they not? Well, the confiscation concern is theoretically always there. Let, let me discuss that in a moment and first yeah. answer uh, your first question. Right. The fact is, is that we're not going to, no, no one's just going to wave a magic one and somehow get us back onto a gold standard. It's not going to happen that sure. way. It, it might be quite disruptive. It, it might it might be only mildly disruptive depending on how it's done, but you still have to go through a transition period. The transition period will have to reprice gold to a level which allows it to be valued vis-a-vis -vis the global asset base and global trade volumes in a way that implies equilibrium. What I mean by that is that today the gold price is too low to allow markets to clear because assets are overvalued vis-a-vis -vis gold and you need to rebalance the global economy such that you don't have these imbalances, which are huge, right? As a result of all the dollar accumulation as reserves uh, through the decades of Bretton Woods. So the gold price needs to rise by an order of magnitude uh, in order to allow that system to work. So you go through this phase transition when the price of gold has to rise by an order of magnitude. Uh, in my book, I go through some calculations what that order of magnitude would be. And indeed, they're based on calculations that have been made before by other economists, including under Bretton Woods. I mean, would you believe we take it for granted today? We think, oh, gee, Bretton Woods is a stable system. It just worked. Nobody questioned it. That's not true. There was lots of debate and discussion during already the 1950s, but in particular the 1960s, that the U.S. money and credit supply was growing too quickly to be credibly backed by gold anymore and to allow Bretton Woods to function. And so there was already this dispute going on that gold was going to have to be revalued at some point. And indeed, gold was revalued. Uh, before Bretton Woods broke down completely. They tried to go through a revaluation process, but it just wasn't enough. It didn't properly rebalance international trade. And, as, and it all blew up in the end when the U.S. basically lost patience uh, with the rest of the world. So, you know, that's how it happened then. But back then, the world was still very unipolar in political, economic, and military terms. It's far mm -hmm. less so today. So I think uh, today, the revaluation that gold would have to go through to imply a stable international monetary equilibrium is huge. And by implication, according to my calculations, you're talking something in the region of about $50,000 per ounce being a reasonable market clearing price for gold if you fully go back uh, to a gold-backed international monetary system. Okay. 50,000. Yeah, that was my, uh, that was my question for your, your long term, uh, not outlook, but a, a figure for gold that would make sense based on your, uh, based on your calculations. Um, okay. Uh, well, I, I, I've got to ask you, why, why can't a Bitcoin standard be appropriate? Some would argue that, uh, uh, Bitcoin shares similar properties in terms of its uh, limited supply. In fact, it has a cap supply. Gold has limited supply. It doesn't have a, it doesn't have a theoretical cap, but Bitcoin has a hard cap. Um, it can't be printed by the government. It's outside of government control. It shares many similar properties as gold. So can Bitcoin replace gold as a standard of currency? I, I, look, I regard Bitcoin as a fascinating monetary experiment, and there's really much to admire about that. I've been watching it from very early days and have truly been fascinated by it. And I, and I truly respect um, the, you know, the, the effort behind it uh, and, and, the, and the effort to develop an ecosystem around it. But as that development has taken place, it has become evident to me uh, that Bitcoin, while very elegant uh, in its maths, uh, is less efficient than is generally assumed as a monetary base. Now, I stress the word base. I'll elaborate on that in a moment. Basically, the issue here is that information theory, which was pioneered by Claude Shannon and others uh, already back in the 1940s, and it is, is the basis today of how internet protocols work with respect to sending bits of information around and all, all computer storage, zeros and ones, basically. It, it, it has to do with energy. Well, how much energy does it take to switch from a zero to a one or back again or transfer that information from point A to point B? The maths behind that is very, very, uh, well, it's fascinating and very complex, but it reduces to this. Bitcoin, sadly, is too energy efficient 
to allow for information transmission at global scale. It's just not efficient enough. It consumes way too many BTUs, as it were. Now, people are trying to solve that problem and make it more efficient by layering on top. They're stacking on top of it things like the Lightning Network, say, or Taproot and these sorts of uh, protocols and everything else. Well, that sounds nice on paper, but understand that undermines one of the original selling points of Bitcoin was that it was fully decentralized. But if fully decentralized, it's too inefficient. So, okay, centralize it, but then you're creating points of failure. You're creating points of potential regulation and interference and potential points of fraud. And so a lot of the benefits of Bitcoin are lost as you try to come to terms with its energy inefficiency. Now, why does that make gold somehow better? Well, guess what? As a monetary base layer, gold requires zero energy to maintain because Mother Nature simply created it. It's non-reactive. It has essentially zero entropy and it cannot be destroyed. Okay. I mean, it can be dispersed or it can be redispersed, but it can't really be destroyed in a physical sense. Bitcoin sadly lacks all of those immutable properties. And so as a monetary base, gold is superior. And therefore, if gold's the superior base, that's what you want to stack on top of. Go ahead and take a technology like Bitcoin, back it with gold, and build your monetary system on that. Hey. More power to you. I think it would be a great idea. But to have Bitcoin itself be the monetary base, hugely inefficient, I don't think that could possibly work. And people would realize that. It would just become too expensive and, and it wouldn't work. Yeah, I think you were uh, referring to the uh, blockchain trilemma problem. Uh, no blockchain could have currently uh, all three properties, uh, scalability, decentralization, and security at the same time, and most two. So yes, you're right, people are working on this problem. Some claim to have solved this problem, but you know that's debatable. Uh, so John, you're advocating for maybe a gold standard that is digitized would be the ideal hybrid system. Absolutely. Look, I'm a huge fan of technology. Technology is behind all human progress, okay? I'm not going to sit here and say that we should go back to the coinage of the 19th century. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But why not take advantage of whatever latest, greatest information technology is out there and use that to transmit title to gold from one place to another in exchange for goods and services, or to purchase assets or whatever it is, why not do that in the most efficient information theory way possible, which hopefully is also uh, secure and all of that, but back it by gold to remove the entropy of the base layer. That to me is the holy grail. And indeed, I'm very confident someday we're going to get there. Okay, uh, I just want to end on this point. Uh, well, two points actually. First, let's talk about confiscation very quickly because you, you mentioned that. You said that it's always uh, yes. a risk. Uh, why is that? I look, it is a risk, and there are examples in history of governments confiscating gold. Now, what's interesting, in more cases than not, it ends up bringing down the government. And the history of the UK is very instructive in this regard. Uh, King John tries to confiscate gold, and they send him packing in short order. Charles I does confiscate gold and loses his head. <laughs> not, not too long thereafter. Um, so at least in the UK, it may, it may, it, there may be a risk of it, but it tends to result in very bad well, outcomes. Ro for Roosevelt those, did know, it. Little, he didn't. Roosevelt did it. He didn't lose his head, though. <laughs> no, no, no. But he he didn't. Conf he's he confiscated it. Yes and no. Yes. It was one of those. It was kind of a don't ask, don't tell confiscation. Okay. You could you could hoard it if you wanted to. And indeed, households that did hoard it uh, ended up. Being, you know, finally relieved of that burden in the 1970s when it was made legal for U.S. households to, to own gold again. So, um, but Roosevelt did devalue the dollar very, very substantially versus gold to try and relieve the deflationary pressure uh, of the Great Depression and make the U.S. more competitive uh, in export markets once again. So that that was still a form of wealth confiscation for sure, absolutely uh, one that was, you know, arguably unconstitutional, and and I, I personally believe it is. Was. Um, so look, the risk is never going to go away. But I would say this. Physical gold, if you do, if you do own it in your possession or have it stored in a very safe jurisdiction with strong property rights and protections for, for private property, um, if someone's going to try to seize that gold. They're going to have to give very good reasons for it. They're going to have to give evidence of criminal wrongdoing. They're going to have to give evidence of, you know, something which will be accepted 
um, by whatever legal authority is in place in whatever jurisdiction this is taking place. That means that gold is kind of a monetary habeas corpus. You can only confiscate physical gold by actually taking physical, potentially violent action to do so if you're doing it against someone's will or another country's will, if that country, for example, provides a neutral jurisdiction to uh, hold people's gold securely. So you have to make a very public issue out of confiscating gold, and that tends to make the government doing so look pretty bad. If you purport to be a free, open, progressive democracy, and you're behaving that way, it undermines your credibility and legitimacy. It wakes people up to possible tyranny. And so actually, I think this is one reason why, among other people, Alan Greenspan argued back in the day that gold was essential to both economic and general personal political freedom. A final point, and I'll let you go. We talked about the, uh, uh, the, um, future of the global monetary system. But let's talk about the value of these fiat currencies themselves. Uh, I've heard uh, the argument that in the past, historically, most fiat currencies have devalued by at least 99% if you trace the history of the entire currency. Uh, is this going to continue happening? Well, look, the way the system is current being run, it has to happen by definition. It's the only way you can keep the banking system afloat. Uh, that's the problem we have here, right? We're we're in this terminal phase. We've crossed the Rubicon. We've crossed the event horizon. There is no way to, con to keep the current system functioning without continuing to inflate. Inflation is endemic now. There's no way to come back out of this. And therefore, you either inflate to oblivion or you eventually reset the system. I think there's a lot of acceptance now that one of those two has to happen. Of course, if you're in, <laughs> if, if you're a policymaker, you're an economic official and you're in charge, you prefer a reset. That's easier said than done. But all the discussion about CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, all the discussion about, you know, potentially creating a new currency basket, be it for the BRICS, be it for the world at large. All this discussion, which is very open and active now, about various forms of monetary restructuring, I believe all of that is based on concerns that we, that we actually have to reset the system in order to not just inflate into oblivion. Uh, they, may, they won't say that that's the choice we're making because it sounds kind of embarrassing to suggest, gee, our policies have led to this awful, di you know, awful, awful dilemma. Um, but that's where we are, in my opinion. All right. Very good. John, excellent analysis. I, uh, thank you very much for your time today. I learned a lot. I hope you uh, return to the show. Oh, my pleasure, David. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more.